Dear families, dear patients, my name is Hermann Gischek. I'm a pediatric rheumatologist and I'm very honored to give a statement on chronic non-bacterial osteomyelitis for the Childhood Arthritis and Rheumatology Research Alliance, CARA. My task today is to summarize uh, a complex disease uh, which we currently uh, call chronic non-bacterial osteomyelitis. At first, I will focus on the history uh, of this disease, on its pathogenesis, what is chronic non-bacterial osteomyelitis. I will mention some differential diagnoses. I will focus on how to diagnose this rare disease. I will focus on how to treat this disease and I will give some aspects on the prognosis. Let me come back about 30 to 40 years. At that time, there were occasional reports from Northern European Scandinavian countries reporting on juvenile patients who were affected by bone inflammation on a chronic means and uh, with a somehow repetitive or recurrent feature. This disease was long lasting and chronic and at that time uh, the colleagues uh, tried to find out whether this is a bacterial osteomyelitis. Bone biopsies were done and sometimes a bacteria called Propionibacterium acnes was isolated. Therefore, antibiotic therapy was uh, instituted and uh, the patient improved. However, there was still a significant uh, fraction of patients, more than half of them, who did not improve. So, surgical and orthopedic treatments like gross bone resections were implemented or chronic or repetitive antibiotic therapy. At that time, there was also um, some experience that an anti-inflammatory medication, like using so-called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen or naproxen, were uh, beneficial. At that time, one was, uh, the colleagues were thinking that this was just a symptomatic treatment. Then in the 90s, there were reports that uh, uh, some physicians were not able to isolate bacteria and especially they were not able to isolate Propionibacterium acnes. So, um, more deliberate microbial analysis changed the focus of this uh, disease. Um, there were thoughts that it might uh, resemble a rheumatoid disease of bone with a, a chronic um, inflammation coming out of the body itself. And in this time also came the development of the concept of auto-inflammatory diseases affecting mainly the joints and other tissues. Finally, with very deliberate microbial analysis, in some cohorts, um, Strong evidence was gathered that uh, a auto-inflammatory condition was present in chronic non-bacterial osteomyelitis. And today, with more than 15 to 20 years of research, we know that there is a cytokine imbalance in the bone. What are cytokines? Cytokines are mediators of the immune system. Uh, helping uh, the immune cells to do crosstalk. And uh, researchers have found that some of those cytokines, predominantly, predominantly IL-1 and TNF-alpha, are elevated. These are pro-inflammatory cytokines leading to inflammation when they're present. In addition, and very important, some impairing cytokines uh, like interleukin-10, IL-10, are less expressed. So again, uh, 
propagating inflammation. So what is it in the patient? What do we see? We see a localized, sometimes multifocal bone inflammation. And most of the patients not only have bone inflammation, but also the surrounding tissue around the bone. Adiation joints are affected. The metaphysis of the long bones, like the legs and the arms, the spine and the clavicle can be primarily affected. Some other tissues, like the skin, uh, can have a chronic inflammatory condition resembling psoriasis. It's mainly affecting the palms and the soles of the feet. We call it palm or plantar pustulosis. Patients with a very multifocal presentation of bone inflammation also might be affected by inflammation of the gut, a chronic inflammation like Crohn's disease or colitis. In the differential diagnosis, we have to consider rare metabolic bone diseases like hypophosphatasia and monogenetic autoinflammatory diseases. These are the diseases showing the same type of bone inflammation like cherubism. However, we have one particular gene which has been identified as a genetic cause. There is a genetic impairment with chronic non-bacterial osteomyelitis. This um, genetic inheritance has not been um, found so far. At the moment, we consider um, chronic non-bacterial osteomyelitis as a multi genic disease which is not directly inherited. How can we diagnose the disease? Unfortunately, there are no standard blood tests to make uh, the right diagnosis. Usually, infl inflammation parameters are only minor elevated, so we need imaging techniques. Usually one would do a conventional x-ray showing that the bone is kind of enlarged. We call it hyperostosis. In some instances, like when the spine is affected, we might also have bone fractures. Vertebral compressions. Usually the bone of the long bones, like legs and arm, does not fracture, but the spine seems to be more sensitive in this regard. Here, fractures are possible. In the 90s, we used bone scintigraphy. This is a radioactive uh, technique showing the whole um, bone skeleton. When there is a higher metabolic turnover, the scintigraphy can be positive. This shows us a nice uh, overview uh, on bone activation. An alternative to bone scintigraphy, which was mainly used about 20 to 30 years ago, an alternative is the magnetic resonance imaging called MRI. Magnetic resonance imaging has the potential to either show uh, the whole body as uh, a screening tool in addition to localized uh, imaging. MRI is able to show the water content of the tissue, which is a surrogate for inflammation. In the end, MRI cannot make a histological diagnosis. So at the moment, lesions which are present just on one location, we call it unifocal, they still are considered uh, to be subject, subjected to biopsy because one lesion itself, um, it is hard to distinguish a malignant bone disease or a chronic inflammatory bone lesion. If the picture of the lesion distribution is multifocal, 
and it's affecting the typical region, like the metaphysis of the long bone, then a biopsy might be not necessary, and the colleagues, the pediatric rheumatologists, might directly go to treatment. This, come, this brings me to the question, how to treat the disease? I already mentioned in the beginning that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications like ibuprofen, naproxen, diclofenac were used effectively on a symptomatic basis. Long-term follow-up of several patient cohorts have shown that about 60 to 70 percent of patients who were identified and treated early in the course of disease experienced a complete clinical and imaging remission. So the total, um, um, so the effect of the treatment was very effective. Pain uh, was able to be controlled, impairment of motion was able to be controlled. But what to do with about 30 to 40 percent of patients who do not experience this complete remission? For those, glucocorticoids have been used to enhance the effect of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication. And if this co-therapy is not effective, colleagues are used classical disease-modifying anti-rheumatic agents like methotrexate or sulfasalazine. Since about 20 years now, um, a totally different treatment concept has been developed uh, in rheumatology. I already mentioned in the beginning cytokines as the key players of inflammation at the site of the bone inflation. Uh, inflammation. Today, with the usage of so-called biologicals, we can directly target the action of these inflammatory mediators like interleukin-1 or TNF-alpha. By blocking these cytokines directly and selectively, also a patient can improve significantly. But which concept is now the best for which patient? Do we need stronger therapy for multifocal disease compared to mono or unifocal disease? These questions are not answered yet because there are no comparative and controlled studies available at the moment comparing different treatment strategies. Therefore, CARA has taken the lead and has formulated a treat-to-target protocol giving different treatment arms as options to the physician and the patients. At the moment, these uh, protocols have been set up and in the very near future, uh, patients will be offered different types of treatment and by doing this on an international basis, enough information will be gathered to be able to suggest the optimal treatment arm based on the, based on the current knowledge on the disease. How is the prognosis of the disease? Significant pain and impairment of motion, arthritis, skin and gut inflammation can really impair uh, the daily life of our patients. Therefore, a significant uh, treatment protocol, hopefully without side effects, is uh, urgently needed. The bone of the vertebrae, uh, the spine, can have um, fractures during the course of the disease, so the vertebral body can compress and uh, this is a significant sequel of the disease. The long bones, like the legs and the arms, when they are affected, they usually don't fracture. They show bone enlargement because the bone is stimulated 
to grow new bone on its outer surface. This can be also very painful because the outer surface of the bone is very sensitive. Overall, as I mentioned, if we can identify a patient early, we might be able to reach complete clinical and imaging remission in about two-thirds of the patients. And I hope that with the initiative of CARA, we will be able to address the um, impairment and the pain of the patients who did not profit significantly with these new uh, protocols. Treat to target protocols are the mainstay uh, at the moment because um, with orphan diseases, these are very rare diseases, it is hard to set up um, so-called controlled and uh, prospective trials um, in the pharmaceutical industry. I wish CARA uh, lots of uh, success with their treatment protocol. Uh, I wish lots of support with uh, different institutions and international um, supporters, colleagues and families and patients. Uh, they all will be asked to uh, give their consent um, and to contribute to, to this very important international initiative.